Hello, students of world history and Mr. Hogger's class. Here we are again in another week of distance learning now into the month of May. How's it going for you? I hope it's all right. I hope you're like taking the most of the opportunities to do the things that you care about, extend your learning in the areas that interest you the most, like searching things that you hear that are interesting and guiding your own learning, and basically taking the time to read and enjoy the things you do and the people that you love as well. Hopefully you're keeping in touch. I know I'm doing my best here as well. And it's lesson 33, so we're going to talk about the new geopolitics. We've worked our way through centuries, actually thousands of years of history this year. And now, how does the world look today? And how is the nations and the relationships between the world nations shaping the way of the world in which you will grow up in? Let's dive in because there is a lot to talk about. And you can submit one page of bulleted notes as your distance learning option if you prefer the video over the textbook. And we have most of the textbook materials here with us. And today, we're going to travel back to where we were in September when we talked about September 11th. But instead of just focusing on the impact of my emotional memory, we're going to focus on how it changed the world. Let's dive in. So the Arab Spring with the launch of Twitter and social media was an igniting factor that transformed governments and protests from Tunisia to the Middle East to North Africa. And some of those revolts were extremely violent and bloody and changed the sentiment of how the world would respond to dictators in the future in many different nations. Wow. I mean, millions of people took to the streets. On the morning of September 11, 2001, a series of delays made Richard Mueller late to work. His office was on the 100th floor of the Trade Center in New York City. Before he reached his office, an airplane hijacked by terrorists smashed into the North Tower. He realized the delays that morning had saved his life. If I had gotten in an ele elevator just a few minutes earlier, I would be dead. Most Americans can recall exactly where they were when they heard the news. Many people turned on their televisions just in time to see a second passenger plane slam into the South Tower 17 minutes after the first. That's when I remember getting to my TV as well. As fire began consuming the upper floors, most people managed to escape down stairwells, but many did not. Shock turned to horror as the Twin Towers collapsed. The first fell at 9.59, the second about a half an hour later, and a third hijacked passenger jet crashed into the Pentagon building near Washington, D.C. Soon after that, a fourth hijacked plane crashed in Pennsylvania. I was waking up to the Sacramento Kings radio station Sports 1140, uh, as a complete side note, I just interviewed the broadcaster of the Kings, Gary Gerald, and that's on YouTube as well, who is my radio idol. I loved waking up on my alarm clock to Sports 1140, and they were not talking about the Kings, and I was really confused. I thought they'd be talking offseason. There was a big trade that had just happened, and I kept wondering, why is CBS News on this radio station? I went and knocked on my parents' door and said, what's going on? Um, Mom, I think we should turn on the TV. And that's when we saw everything that's happened. And from there, we spent a great deal of time in class talking about what we remember and how difficult that footage is to watch. We don't need to talk about those specific details. Although if you want to look at the timeline, there are many resources online in the museums and the photographs of President Bush being informed at the school he was reading at um, and to all the different actions and photography and videos and heroes of that day. There is so much to revisit and so much to discuss, and it was a day of terror and the worst attack in United States history of our country and how the president addressed the nation and, and brought unity to our country. But the aftermath with Homeland Security and the Patriot Act is where I want to focus on today. So we're going to pick it up in the impacts of the world. So here's where we're going to start. Americans learned that the international terrorist network Al-Qaeda had carried out the 9-11 attacks, led by Osama bin Laden, a wealthy Saudi Arabian and Muslim extremist. And we spent a great deal of time at the beginning of our year discussing that Islam as a religion of peace, as most of the monotheistic religions support uh, taking care of each other and charity and all the things that we have in common and in unity. And this extremist situation was a, a rampant change in awareness for America uh, Al-Qaeda sought to rid Muslim countries of Western influence and establish a pan-Islamic caliphate led by the faith. Um, bin Laden believed that all Muslims had a duty to kill the Americans and their allies. It's a quote, civilian or military. While the vast majority of Muslims rejected bin Laden's words, some felt that the United States didn't respect Islam or threaten Muslim interests, or that they threatened their interests. Bin Laden used those bitter feelings to promote his cause and recruit people all over the world. 
His goal for the 9-11 attacks was to provoke, this is our textbook talking, to provoke the United States into a costly war that would destabilize the world and hemorrhage the U.S. economy from all the changes in the costs. And if you're watching this in April or May of 2020, then you're watching the economic hemorrhage right now of many different industries and with unemployment claims jumping up. And you could see how, how costly disrupting the normal cause of business can be. And that was the goal. He believed that a global ongoing war between the West and the Islamic world could allow him to seize power and establish this pan-Islamic world that he was seeking to create. And we now know that that was unsuccessful and that years later, under President Obama, Osama bin Laden would be found in compromise to a permanent end. But this chapter in our book, this lesson, is about how the world and its history has changed. So instead of focusing, as I said, on the ideals and the, the feelings involved, let's look at what happened afterwards. First of all, the war on terror began in Afghanistan. At that time, a radical group called the Taliban controlled the nation. These ultra-conservative Muslims were known for their harsh punishment and their rules barring women from working, receiving an education, or enjoying other basic rights. Again, this is all from our textbook, TCI. The Taliban has also permitted al-Qaeda to operate their training camps on Afghan soil, which is the reason that we were focused on that area. President Bush asked the Taliban to turn over Osama bin Laden, but the Afghan leaders refused. So a coalition of anti-Taliban Afghan militias to overthrow the Taliban and capture bin Laden were formed. By mid-November, the capital city Kabul and other major cities had fallen and Taliban rule ended. U.S. forces then began to hunt for bin Laden and his followers in many places who had gone into hiding. This is a photo you're going to see of the next chapter, which is the uh, next war in Iraq. So after 9-11, President Bush urged that Iraq be included in the war on terror, even though the Arab nation had no direct action against the United States at this moment. Since taking power in 79, Iraq's dictator Saddam Hussein, who is in the statue being uh, taken down above in the photo. The Sunni and Shia branches of Islam have a long-standing conflict in the Muslim world, and Hussein had also used chemical weapons against the Kurds, an ethnic group in northern Iraq. After the Persian Gulf War, Hussein had gone back on promises to allow UN inspectors to search for weapons of mass destruction. That includes chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons, which the coalition forces had banned. And so with this understanding that these weapons may be present, it was made the argument that we should go in to make safer the world by removing these weapons and these uh, destruction assets. But several European nations that usually would walk step with the United States as allies, including France and Germany, they opposed the invasion of Iraq, and the United Nations also failed to approve it. Coalition forces went in to Iraq and toppled the government within a month. Hussein escaped, but was later captured, and he was put on trial to the justice system of an Iraqi court, and he was executed, and that was broadcast on television, as I recall. United States inspection teams searched for banned weapons, but discovered, to their surprise, that there were no significant weapons of mass destruction. Since that discovery was made, many have questioned whether the United States was justified in that initial invasion of Iraq and raised doubts about Bush's motives for pushing war. David Kay, for example, who led the U.S. search, called for an investigation of the flawed intelligence that went into that decision. And in 2005, a commission on the intelligence capabilities of the U.S. concluded that the intelligence community was dead wrong in almost all of its pre-war judgments about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. What the intelligence professionals told you about Saddam Hussein's programs was what they believed they were simply wrong. This decision and disagreements over the intelligence that went into this decision are still talked about in 2020, and I would imagine months from now, as we sit in April, will be brought up in political and presidential debates between President Trump and candidate Biden as those debates progress, because this is still one of those hotbeds of conversation within the national political historical conversation. So what happened as a result of these decisions? Well, the end of the Cold War brought an era of relative peace. Many hoped that that would continue. But since 9-11, the world has seen a resurgence of violence and tension. International relationships have become strained and hostile, and some resentments have resurfaced. I remember that I've spoken a bit about like my Lebanese friends in 2001, 2002 at our high school 
were the targets of violence and bullying. And that, you know, because my friend Mike was Lebanese, that I would get dragged sometimes. And of all peaceful (laughs) intentions, you know, we were the subject of sometimes fights and things like that, just for for walking together with people who looked a certain way. Uh, When I look at your classrooms, I'm I I see lots of progress that's been made since that time. uh, And I hope that continues to be the case. But counterterrorism is something that we're still left with as a result in our society, increased security, increased tension and concern. And you could see some amplification or resurgence of that when you look around right now in 2020 as well. While we're here on quarantine, uh, before the masks became a required asset this past seven days in Contra Costa County, I when I the couple of times I'd gone out to get groceries, I would if I wasn't wearing a mask, you would see people kind of giving you a look and it reminds me of the time where we looked at each other or treated each other in a way that was, um, you know, could have been jumpy or discriminatory based on the things that we've seen. Like I, my friend Mike with looking in, in Middle Eastern and not looking the same as everyone else at the school in Stockton that I was attending. Uh, we can now look at people who, you know, there were reports going on in the news about people who, if they're from Asian descent, are being treated differently or there's violence towards them in some cities because of like a misunderstanding or an understanding of, you know, if the virus came from China, then treating people like they're responsible for it. So at the time period following 9-11, some European countries didn't agree with what we were doing and that caused a rift. It caused a separation of opinions and alliances. The U.S. further has parted ways on some other matters. For example, in 2017, again, this is our textbook, President Trump announced his intention to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords claiming the efforts to improve our global environment would be hurtful to our economy. European leaders were outraged, and the issue of climate change has become another divisive point where, um, you know, you can look at it as cause and effect or not, or just different dominoes falling, but on on multiple assets, the United States has separated from allies. And as a result, several European countries are now leading that progressive fight for the environment. Uh, There has also been geopolitical changes in our relationship with Russia. It was revealed in 2016 through a series of multi-agency investigations that the Russian government was involved in hacking efforts against the Democratic Party. And the Office of the Director of National Intelligence reported that Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign to undermine public faith in the democratic process, to denigrate Secretary Hillary Clinton, to harm her electability and her potential presidency, and they have high confidence in those reports. Despite the initial friendship between Trump and Putin, other government officials have continued to point out the ongoing issues between the U.S. and Russia. Former House Speaker Republican uh, Paul Ryan said that the Russian government remains hostile to our most basic values and ideals, excuse me, with the information that Russia actively worked into undermining the democracy of the United States. And even the, the disagreement over how much that those agreed upon materials make fa- make fact or whether or not we even agree on that is a rift that now happens between Americans and Americans which could have been the goal of Russia all along just to, to uh, create a doubt about what we can agree on create a doubt about how unified we are create a doubt about how valid our elections are or create a doubt about whether or not it has made a difference and those are things that are challenging to look into And another echo of the Cold War, the United States and North Korea also sparked the occasional tension. And we've seen that during our school year, Uh, the the three or four months of quiet and then the flurry of messages and fear. So this is the world that we live in, in summary, that while not all these things are related to one organization, one country or one group, global geopolitics and the way that we approach threats of terrorism or violence or disruptions to our political system are with us now. It's affected culture. It's created clashes between North Africa, the Middle East, the Western world. It's changed how tense we are between Russia and the United States, how tense we are with Europe at times in the United States. It's changed our economy. It created underemployment. It had created um, authoritarian regimes. Some of them have been uprooted and protested and overthrown since that time. Some of them have not. It's created an environment where information has spread even faster than ever with internet turning from dial-up to broadband to reliable Wi-Fi to reliable 
4G and 5G networks on mobile devices, and that'll continue to change. The more bandwidth that the more people have, the more they will use that to communicate, and the more it will change the way they think, and thus the way they act. It's also changed social structures. It created conflicts between religious sects. It destabilized areas of the world. It formed and deformed and changed and evolved terrorist organizations. It changed how countries respond to those and how the United Nations responds to those. And ultimately, it changes the way that we interact because it is a different world now than it used to be and that many people feel differently about how to approach life. And the disagreements that we have as a country change the way that we elect politicians and what we expect from the politicians and how they deal with the rest of the world. So there are quite a number of changes in how this lesson and geopolitics change the way that we approach the world. And here we are in April, and in a few months, we'll have an election that will, again, change the course of how we interact with the rest of the world, how they see us, how we see them, how we deal with them socially, culturally, economically, and how the next wave of chapters will be written as a result of the actions that we take. It's a lot, right? And it's your future. And it's that interesting point where I remember my teachers towards the end of the year turning to me and say, well, now it's up to you. What would you like to see happen next with your best mindset and what you've read and the facts that you can find? What will you do? And my phone's telling me it's time to go. So we'll see you on the next edition of the Hogger History Podcast. Thanks, everybody.